to Rebecca, and I hope that I can only be as plausible being myself as you were being someone else. Um, <laughs> excellent job. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let me uh, extend my thanks also to the organizers of the conference. I'm grateful to be here with so many like-minded people. Uh, it's, I find these to be very fucking uh, relationship-building moments uh, because oftentimes you find yourself kind of working on an island, uh, especially around questions of education. Even within the institution, you find that many people aren't interested in it, which to me is kind of odd. Um, and uh, I'd also like to comment on the appropriateness of the title of the conference to my talk, uh, School Time! Exclamation uh, mark. And it's appropriate for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first has to do with the use of the imperative voice, which of course at once exhorts the subject to do something, uh, but also evacuates them from the sentence. Uh, and as we're going to see, that's quite relevant to what I'm about to talk about. And also uh, combining the educational institution with the sense of time, uh, and in the case of what I'm about to speak about, uh, this is very much the case. A uh, very peculiar sort of time comes out of the emergence of this new building type and its use. Uh, the spatial configuration and program of these places uh, produces and reproduces entirely new forms and functions of time for Indigenous people. So I'm going to expand on these and other ideas in relation to what I would uh, argue uh, is the most significant institutional system that affected the aims of colonization in this country, namely the Indian residential school system. In recent years, the residential school has been the focus of intensive inquiries, litigation, apology, truth-telling, and reconciliation re efforts. And in many ways, uh, this multifaceted approach to this uh, very difficult and painful past has been instructive for non-Indigenous people uh, because the simple fact of the matter is that Canada functions as a colonial country because of a profound quiet. That's how this thing was able to function for as long as it did and, and Canada was able to maintain this image of itself as a defender of human rights while at the same time being an egregious violator of these same rights. So this has been useful for people to understand this past and also the lingering traumatic after effects that are felt in indigenous communities across the country. But I would argue that despite all of this recent attention, much remains unclear. We are, as a country, sorry, but for exactly what are we sorry? Uh, what is the nature of this offense? And I would also add further, uh, and specifically to what I'm going to speak about today, what precisely is the nature of this institutional system that figured so prominently in this uh, egregious offense? Years of studying existing uh, residential schools, archival plans, archival documents, secondary sources, as well as the testimony of a large number of Indigenous peoples has led me to the following conclusion, that these buildings, these institutions, in fact, are not schools at all. Whereas, uh, and we just got that sense from Richard's paper, uh, schools are meant to provide willing students the tools to improve their standing in their culture and society, the Indian residential schools did precisely the opposite. Rather, by design, and this is especially important, these institutions were meant to alienate Indigenous children from their place within their own culture, within their First Nation, within their community and their families. And these institutions affected this aim by disrupting the functioning most significantly of Indigenous languages, but also Indigenous cultures, religious practices, economies, and political systems. So this interrupting then of the nomenclature school, I think is really important because it helps to, uh, to negate this revisionist apologist trend which we see. Uh, and, and it makes us struggle then to actually think more deeply about what these places actually were. So if they were not schools, what then were they? And I think there's a number of different ways to talk about this. Today I'm going to argue something very specific, uh, and I'm going to connect it to the thought of Giorgio Agamben and talk about them as a space of exception, an extra-legal zone in which Indigenous subjects could be abandoned by the state and quite literally, as we're going to see, exposed to death. The function of these spaces of exception was to bolster a fledgling colonial rule, and this was established by eroding a wider and much older sense of indigenous place rooted in ancestral knowledges, such as oral histories, cultural rituals, hereditary chiefdoms, traditional religions, regional languages, local diets, seasonal travel. Many more features of these lives were interrupted by the system. And in place of this nested, networked series of knowledges, 
uh, these spaces devoid of indigenous belonging, uh, places really without place, shaped by new languages, religious beliefs, work habits, economic philosophies, political systems, medicines, punishments, and yes, new types of architecture as well. So I'm one of several scholars who in recent years has been drawing upon the work of Agamemnon to examine the formation of colonial sovereignty. He doesn't deal with colonization. Uh, and admittedly, there's much to critique about Giorgio Agamemnon. I'm going to avoid much of that here. Uh, but I do think that there are still serviceable elements of his thought that can help us gain new perspectives on the colonial situation here in this country. And I will argue that the design features of the residential schools that we're about to look at will reveal the operation of the sorts of spaces of exception that are outlined in his writing. But before I do that, before I, I explore those connections, I want to say a few things uh, uh, very briefly about the history of the system, its architecture and its policies and its impacts. Now, uh, I should have probably had this up, but this is really just for visual relief of me talking. Um, that's fine. I'm going to, I'll come back to this, not to worry. But that's a, sort of an elevation of, a, of a, quite a, a nasty residential school known uh, colloquially as Little Alcatraz to the people who went there. Um, <clears throat> but we'll start here, which is an image taken from the Department of Indian Affairs annual report, which is almost a projection of a wish of the government and the churches that this education would transform children from a situation, a cultural situation, which they believe to be pathogenic. And this is the way that traditional uh, cultures and, and familiar relations were discussed as being almost a source of contagion. The antidote to this contagion was uh, euphemistically known as aggressive civilization. It was a process learned from the American boarding school system and adapted in Canada. And the general features of this uh, was to separate children from their home communities, forbid the speaking of indigenous languages, and the restricting of familial contact, all of which uh, was meant to draw the child into, and I'm putting scare quotes on this one for good reason, the circle of civilized conditions. So <clears throat> to affect this then, uh, the government became involved in a process that had been going on since the 17th century uh, by missionaries in New France. But after Confederation, they entered into an uneasy relationship with five different Christian denominations, the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of England, uh, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the United Church. And from the beginning, this relationship wasn't a good one. Uh, they were at cross purposes. The churches, of course, were most interested in the civilizing mission and that the government was most interested in exploiting the cheap labor of those willing to staff the schools. And as you can imagine, uh, this led to less than satisfactory results. So this is the first attempt to do this. This particular type of school is different from a residential school. This is an industrial school. And the purpose of the industrial school was to affect the policy of assimilation. The idea was that the schools would be built near urban centers the children would go learn a skilled trade, cabinet maker, a tailor, a shoemaker, something like that. And then after their training, they would leave the school, go to the city, get a job, and somehow forget that they were indigenous. Um, it didn't work uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think two really important ones. One is that, uh, as with later with the residential schools, they were miserly funded by the government. Uh, they never gave enough money for good teachers or for school supplies or even food for that matter. Um, but also, uh, they underestimated the persistence of the importance of culture to the indigenous people, and, and this was a, obviously a huge mistake. So after the, the failure of the, uh, the industrial school experiment, uh, we see the emergence of what I would call the second generation school, a second uh, type of residential school, much larger in scale, usually built in more remote locations, um, and it, it signals a shift in policy from true assimilation, which turned out again to be very expensive, uh, to one of segregation. So we'll, you often hear people talk about the residential schools and assimilation. It's actually not correct. Uh, from about 1910 to 1951, the policy was more one of segregation, of reinforcing of a Canadian apartheid, which uh, was established with the, with the reserve system. And really, the residential school and the reserve should be thought of as twins. Uh, in this way, and they're really not uh, enough, at least to my way of thinking. Okay, so this is a template design produced in-house by architects under the employ of the Department of Indian Affairs, stamped out and repeated with some variation uh, across the country. 
meant to hold, again, way more students, uh, segregated by gender and age. Uh, and this had the way, this had a feature then of uh, dissolving connections for people to where they came from. Not only would you be, uh, you know, separated from your siblings by definition because they would be uh, younger or older, but also by gender. Uh, and this not only split up families, but also communities. Uh, they were bolstered by the passing into law of compulsory education in 1920, uh, which made uh, a situation, a very regrettable situation emerge where uh, members of the church, the RCMP, and uh, Indian agents would travel to remote locations, round children up without consent of, the, consent of their parents, load them onto trucks and ships and planes and send them to these schools. Uh, not all students, of course, uh, were taken uh, against their will. Some attended voluntarily. That point is important. Uh, but as has been explained to me by uh, certain Indigenous people, that this has to be considered in the context of colonization, that uh, if something like this had happened when their communities were vibrant and they were not subject to uh, the loss of game animals, for instance, the spread of uh, catastrophic spread of disease, um, the introduction, uh, introduction to alcohol and so on, that this uh, choice wouldn't have seemed, seemed nearly as attractive. So these schools um, were, as I've already said, poorly funded. Uh, inadequate curriculum, uh, serviced with inadequate curriculum, uh, and of course these were boarding schools. Children lived here. Uh, the diets were uh, quite terrible. Uh, many lived in malnutrition. As a matter of fact, there's been a recent study pu published by Ian Mosby who made it clear that uh, the government conducted food experiments and uh, tested nutritional um, like vitamins and so on on children. And it, consciously, intentionally malnourished others to establish a research baseline. Uh, and so this suggests to us that there's much about this that we don't understand. If this is there, I would suggest it's kind of a tip of the iceberg situation. Uh, harsh corporeal punishments, uh, whippings, confinement in stocks, electrical shocks are the sort of more dramatic features of this. Um, but there were also, you know, on an everyday level, just neglect, apathy, uh, and indigenous children don't respond well to uh, physical punishment. That's the other thing. This is a huge culture shock for them. And uh, there have been many accounts of Indian agents traveling with disdain, talking about the fact that the, the parents never hit their children, that they never scolded them even. But this is, of course, it's a major cultural difference. So you can imagine then that being uh, even chastised was something that was uh, uh, traumatic to these kids. It goes on like this, high fatalities owing to disease. Uh, some of the schools as high as 60% per year mortality rate in over two decades. Uh, one uh, especially bad instance, File Hills, 74% mortality rate uh, over a 14 year period. And this prompted um, uh, the chief uh, medical officer for the Department of Indian Affairs to publish uh, a paper first in 1907 and then a book later where he challenged the government. He said, you know, what are you doing about the situation? They sat on their hands, uh, and then eventually he came to the conclusion that this was, and this is the name of the book, A National Crime, uh, really a type of uh, crime against humanity. So this, <laughs> and it goes on. Uh, child molestation is so rampant that eventually, uh, when it came to the public attention in 1990s, uh, in a series of uh, very, uh, again, high-level court cases that went to the Supreme Court, uh, that the, uh, the judge labeled the system institutionalized pedophilia. So at this point, uh, we're still contending with what this is. And again, this takes me back to this question of what is the nature of the system? Because I honestly don't think we're there yet. I think we're still trying to figure out what this actually was. We haven't even gotten that far. We do know that there is intergenerational trauma, which is profound. And uh, even people who didn't attend are subject to the, uh, the difficulties that emerge in communities, substance abuse, ongoing sexual abuse, high suicide rates, and a lack of family cohesion. Uh, and of course, it's not all hopeless. I know a lot of people, uh, Indigenous people, who are working in, in a really positive way uh, to, to help them, and I would suggest the rest of us, uh, come along and heal uh, from this past. Okay, so... Uh, I know that's really dark and, and painful, but I, I thought it was important to say that. I, I couldn't just skip over the historical part and start talking about architecture. Uh, 
so allow me now to elaborate a little bit on uh, Agamben's use of the notion of space of exception, uh, and then I'll try to apply it to some of these rooms. I don't think I'll get through all of them, but I think you'll get the idea. So most of you have probably read some of this work. Uh, Agamben's main contribution, or his most popular one, is about the idea of uh, the state of exception or the state of emergency. And what he's doing is trying to figure out where the authority or the power of the sovereign uh, rests in modern liberal democracies. And his conclusion is that because rule of law can be suspended at will, that this creates this very strange situation. We may want to think that law is where authority rests, but he makes clear that if a leader can suspend law, then that authority rests somewhere between law and that decision to suspend it in this, what he would call, zone of indistinction. And what this means for all of us, really, in this room, is something quite uncomfortable. That what we accept as a political life, that we're protected, that we have rights, we have papers, and so on, uh, really doesn't mean anything. That, in fact, any of us could be, at an inopportune moment, drawn into uh, what he would call bare life. A, a, a creaturely life shorn of all political protection and identity. So, What's interesting about this as well is that he says that these people who become homo sacra, who become bare life, are not some remainder. It's not something that's left over of the sovereign. It's actually at the very core of it that these non-people really help to define what it is to belong meaningfully, to be inclusively included in a political state requires those who are inclusively excluded. Now, he says as well, and this is relevant to what I'll, I'll say now, uh, that these require what he would call spaces of exception. That this can't just happen anywhere, that there has to be these zones of unbridled authority where everything is truly possible. And remember, he's saying this is how sovereign power is formed. So I've taken this and applied it here to suggest that uh, the establishment of a colonial sovereign power required the negating and dissolving of 633 sovereign nations. That's what was here. And how was this affected? And from my point of view, this notion helps to explain the way that this institutional system functions and helps also to, in some way to define uh, precisely what it is. So what then can we see when we look at these? And I have to say, this is a very difficult history to work on the archives are closed, they've been destroyed, uh, you just you can't get the material. So initially when I started researching, I, I came across plans and images, and particularly the plans, and I thought, wow, they really should have locked these away as well, as we're going to see, because they speak volumes about the nature of the system. So first, the location of construction is relevant. As I've already said, uh, they move them out into remote, remote locations. Catchment is also strange. Uh, how catchment worked. There's no real smoking gun on this, but I've talked to a lot of different people who are confused about the fact that they have six siblings who went to six different institutions than they did, mm -hmm. and that they moved around. Now, I did manage to find this from a, from a Department of Indian Affairs annual report by an official, high-ranking official, Hader Reed, who says, and it's not the clearest writing, forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase afterwards, the more remote from the institution and distant from each other are the points from which pupils are collected the better for their success. In other words, atomize communities, spread them as far as possible, and this will help affect this aim of, again, cutting the roots of belonging, you know, which are, again, connected through language, cultural traditions, religious practices, economic philosophies, collective living, uh, and political rule as well, which has been well established, obviously, for thousands of years. So one, one person who I've worked with on this, uh, Adeline Brown, is a Haida woman from, from uh, Haida Gwaii, and she, she was sent to Edmonton uh, from you know, the West Coast. And she said when she was there, all the years that she was there, she didn't remember a single parent coming to visit the children who were there, not one. And so this suggests, again, uh, this inclusive exclusion into Canadian society. Where do these people fit? Because they no longer fit at home. They would go home in the summers. They were out. These schools really worked 
uh, to do what they were trying to do. Now, not all of them were constructed uh, that far away. Some of them were closer, and so because of that, they couldn't uh, stop people from visiting. And so they devised, this is a Roman Catholic institution, they devised <coughs> this here, the uh, racially segregated Indian's room. And this was a visiting room uh, for parents that would come and visit the child. And you can see that the parents didn't come through the central processional way of the institution, but they were led here through a separate doorway. The child would be led in from their uh, a separate corridor here, and then they would meet in this room. And um, the visits would be closely supervised to make sure that no indigenous language was spoken and no contraband was exchanged. And again, uh, in interview, uh, informants have said no one dared, because this was especially a strict school, no one dared risking uh, saying anything in their own language because the punishments were so severe. severe. And so there are accounts then of grandparents sitting there with their grandchildren and not being able to speak to them because they didn't speak English or French. And of course, this is how all of the knowledge, all of the teaching happened between the generations, oral tradition, and of course, all of that then is subverted. And this is a political move. This is not, uh, it, it has to be considered this way. One of the frustrations that I have about researching this field is that uh, there's something almost glamorous about psychosexual trauma. It takes up all of the space in the press. It's how we tend to think about the suffering of the children. But the reality is that this was about subverting sovereignty. By dissolving linguistic and cultural ties to family, this affects an alienation, which is much more profound than interpersonal. <laughs> Think about it in the context of the forcible relocations of children, mortality rates that I've already talked about, no right to vote, no right to legal representation, apartheid-like segregation on reserves, the past system, which was still intact uh, around this time. And you can see that this is part of a much broader system, and the purpose of which is to negate the most, the fullest expression of identity that people have, which is sovereignty, which is the right of a people to negotiate and identify for them what matters in the world and what territory belongs to them. And to me, this is uh, a key piece in this. It works on this sort of micro level, but the concerns are very macro. So um, here is another one of these rooms, uh, the monitor room. And you can see how this works. The monitor enters unseen here, and there are three windows, one looking out onto the school grounds, another curtained uh, window looking into the small boys' dormitory, and another curtained window looking into the boys' lavatory. And this uh, is supported by this obsession with the corporeal and moral hygiene of students that you pick up in the sources, both from people who survived the system, but also from uh, sources that were writing about the way that the schools should be. Uh, ran. There was this sort of inspection of bodies which happened regularly coming out of showers. Uh, people's bedding was looked at to see if they were uh, wetting the bed and so on. And all the while with this constant reinforcement that they were, excuse me for saying this, dirty Indians is sort of a very common thing that was said to them. Now, if you look at this uh, earlier instance of a dormitory, um, or rather of a monitor room here, you can see that uh, it does provide some means for surveillance, but it's much less invasive. You notice that there is privacy here uh, in the dorms, and obviously this is not uh, at all part of the situation. Um, and to me, that intensification is important. The, the architects who designed these schools in the DIA came out of these schools. They went to these sorts of boarding schools. They understood them very well, and they were, uh, again, uh, as far as they were concerned, probably evolving this architectural form to do this very different job uh, than what they were being exposed to. I know that I'm running a little short on time here. Uh, I'll stop in, a, in a five minutes or so. Um, the dormitories are also really important. Notice how cramped uh, the space is. These, are, these show the way that they wanted the beds to be arranged in the rooms. So for me, this was quite a find uh, because the scale of the drawing here on the side tells you how many square feet all the rooms were. So I did the calculations, I figured out the square footage per student, and the standard is far below any other institution uh, that was to be designed in Europe or North America, and that even includes prisons. Uh, 
Uh, but the, what's important in this is that this is not only a, a problem of this sort of warehousing of students uh, and the lack of privacy and the lack of respect for personal space. This has to be understood in the context of the TB outbreaks that I already talked about. And that was widely understood in this time how tuberculosis was spread. So to jam children together like this in this moment of great epidemic was either just idiocy uh, or worse, uh, you know, like gross uh, misconduct or, you know, it raises all kinds of questions. Again, about the criminality of the system. And some people go as far as to suggest that this is a genocidal system. These are where the debates really are on the nature of, of the system. I'm going to avoid that question for the moment. But here again, um, you know, these, <laughs> these sinks are about this high off the ground. So when you stand there and you look at them, it's just sickening and heart-wrenching to see how close together they are. When, it, again, it was widely understood that spittle was the primary means for transmitting TB. This also has to be understood uh, in the context of a country that was rapidly building sanatorium for the treatment of tuberculosis, but not one for indigenous people, and oftentimes they found themselves refused treatment at these hospitals. In fact, the first uh, sanatoria, sanatorium for the, for the treatment of TB opened in 1941 in all places, a repurposed residential school at Kokoritsa. So, am I there yet? Should I stop? There's more. <laughs> it's up to you. Well, I mean, I don't want to be one of those people who say I have to keep talking when we want to have some discussion. I mean, we get the idea, right? Chapels and, chapels and every, maybe I'll just freestyle here for a couple of minutes, okay? Chapels in every school. Secular education was not a possibility. It was understood that, and I'm just going to quote this one because this is especially important. This comes from John A. MacDonald, of course, our first prime minister. Secular education is a good thing amongst white men, but amongst Indians, the first object is to make them good Christians by applying proper moral restraints. Now, the problem with this is, and, and this you learn from working with indigenous people, is that many of them are quite devout. And you can't say that they are victims of false, false consciousness, that they don't know their own minds. They know their own minds. They know what they believe. So to me, this says this is an incredibly complicated history, and it requires a tolerant mind uh, to, to work through it. But to me, it doesn't answer the question of the nature of the institution. And that's what I keep coming back to. What is this place? Uh, maybe you've seen this before, Lacombe's Ladder. It's a catechism teaching aid that was used in the, in, in the residential schools, designed specifically for them. Uh, the lighting, it's difficult to see, but you'll notice that indigenous people only appear, uh, where is it, here. When the ships come over from Europe, they first appear in the world. And it situates them in this Christian eschatology, and here is sort of the end of the world, and where some of the children are led across to the blessed land, most of them sort of proceed here and end up in this hell uh, at the end for not converting to Christianity. And these were used to teach children in the schools uh, uh, the perceived sort of satanic dangers of their own uh, spiritual and religious beliefs and practices. So, back to this question then of inclusive inclusion. This curriculum functioned in this way, both religious and secular. Uh, this interest in language, in math, in geography, in history, worked against traditional methods of teaching and discipline. And it has to be understood that for the most part the students who came out of here were not prepared to do anything. They were set up to fail, essentially. And and by design, I would suggest, they really weren't rigorously teaching them to do anything useful. In fact, the whole idea was that they would learn how to, you know, a bit about animal husbandry, how to farm, how to take care of a household, and then they would go back to the reserve and then scramble the program back in the reserve. That was what was hoped. And I have found uh, direct quotes on that, that this was their aim to do this. Uh, okay, fine, I'll end here. Uh, the bell, the ringing of the bell, and the people talk about this, uh, so many of them with such a disdain, it announced with mechanical rhythm this imposition of an alien conception of time. Gone was this sense that time was holistic in favor of time sort of being beads on a string. But not only that kind of time, but also time discipline. The perception was that indigenous people were indolent, 
and that they needed to learn industry. And industry is the sort of fetishistic worldview and the way that they conduct their body, the way that they gesture, and so on. Um, okay, so I'll leave it there, but I will say that um, these examples that we've looked at, the Indian's room, the monitor room, the dormitory, the chapel, the bell, uh, announced and served as spaces of exception that helped to sever indigenous belonging to ancient understandings of the place. And that's really what this is about. To me, the primary feature in all of this is when language is lost, what does this mean? Language is not just the, the method or the means of describing the world, it's the way of making the world, every aspect of it. And so when a language is gone, a world dies. That's what actually happens. And that's what was happening in these places. That was their aim. And so for us, you know, and I don't presume to know everyone's identity in here, but I would say for non-Indigenous people in this country, uh, the challenge is to not accept the spurious Stephen Harper apology of 2008, the neglect and abuse hypothesis that he advanced. This is much deeper than that, much more profound. It's going to take a long time for us to work through what this actually means. But uh, at minimum, it's a crime against humanity, at minimum. And that's very clear if you read the UN sort of definition of crime against humanity is this is so clearly a crime against humanity. So this country was founded on a crime against humanity. Are we prepared to accept this? But this is where we are. And this is what we are charged with working towards, at least self-reflexive, thoughtful people in this country. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.